As a five foot eight inch fourth grader, he took his first hook shot and missed. But he liked how it felt, and he tried it again, then again. Three decades later, he scored more points than anyone in NBA history. Yet Kareem Abdul-Jabbar remains an isolated, some say tortured man, whose head, like his hook shot, is above the clouds. We used to call it the last leg of our offense. We always knew, and, and Kareem was the ultimate bailout guy. Kareem, Kareem was just awesome. What a beautiful shot. I still can't believe today that people don't work on the hook shot. Kareem was probably, to size and his, his sky hook, the most dominating force in our league as far as getting the basket anytime you want it. Everybody's waving their arms. It's into Kareem. Kareem swing left, right hand, 12 footer good! The new king of scoring has ascended his throne. He had such incredible pride. He carried the NBA for 20 years on that left leg. The essence of the sky hook day was the efficiency of it. He gets you where he wants you, man. He just takes his time. Nobody could stop it. He had it now, like in his sleep. I was laying in the bed. I was dreaming, sky hook, sky hook. He scored that many on me. So I called my mother. I said, it was Mother's Day. I said, Mom, happy Mother's Day. She said, why did that man score all them points on you? It was just a brilliant shot and part and parcel of his personality. Let me just turn my back on you and beat you. He became sort of the brooding genius, almost the jazz genius, turning his back on the audience. Almost Miles Davis in short pants and a little taller. He was the most private, great player I've ever seen. And sometimes it was very difficult to read him. One day Kareem would come in and he would say, hey man, how you doing, how's your thing? You playing good, young fellow. Next day you see him, he'd be like, wouldn't, wouldn't talk to you. The one guy that I never felt that I ever came close to really getting to know was, was Kareem. There'd be some interaction there, but by far the most aloof guy and the most moody guy. I think there was a condescension throughout his career of um, who are you to be asking me that? How many games have you ever won? He's a spoiled brat, basically. And uh, great player, so he got more spoiled. It was self-serving for the media to, to say that, because then they could uh, use me as the bad guy, uh, writing about a bad guy who is in incorrigible, that sells more copy than somebody that you have to sit down and listen to. You, know, you only got 15 points in the fourth quarter. Nobody's picking, I'm just asking. He is a very complex person. I'm not sure how comfortable he is with being Kareem. Kareem doesn't necessarily like being seven foot three. Kareem likes to be noted for his brain. Certain people demand their own space. He just demanded his space. He stayed to himself. He read a lot. That was Kareem. He'd get on an airplane, put the big blanket up over his head, and heaven forbid that your seat ended up next to him on the plane. It's, it's kind of like forbidden territory. Lou Alcindor was isolated by his height. He was isolated by his intelligence. I mean, he's not smart for an athlete. He's smart. What was discussed on the bench uh, coming into that last seven seconds? It was a shot to John McLaughlin. It was John shot? How did you wind up with it? Everybody else was pressured. He would answer questions almost uh, with no passion, with, with, with no uh, emphasis, just answer the question, wait for the next one. You never felt that you were totally comfortable with him. I think basically he felt uncomfortable in social situations. That was difficult for him. He's big, he's black, he's politically outspoken, he's a Muslim. For the longest time, he just felt people didn't like him. Born in 1947 and raised in a predominantly white section of New York City, a shy, studious Lou Alcindor was sent to a Catholic boarding school outside Philadelphia in the fourth grade. Though he stayed only a year, the experience left an indelible mark. It wasn't a very happy experience for me. Coming from New York and being in the only black kid in, in a just about all white school and then going into an all black environment was uh, kind of like culture shock. When you're in fourth grade and your parents send you to boarding school, I, I guess you, you do wonder, geez, maybe my parents don't want me around. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's my fault. He was introverted and when he grew up, his height wasn't a blessing at that time. It was more like a curse. Hey, how's the weather up there? That shapes somebody. Because uh, I know on the other end, how's the weather down there? That also shapes you. And it creates an anger, it creates an edge, it creates something that you use just as defense. Lou's best defense was to excel on the basketball court. 
He became nationally known at Power Memorial High School, where he led his team to three city Catholic championships. But what burned deep in his memory was one ugly word uttered by his coach during a halftime speech. Coach Donahue suggested I was playing like a stereotypical person of my color uh, that people would refer to as a nigger. The use of the word was you can't allow the idiots, I mean there are idiots that ever came, can't allow those idiots sitting way up in the stands to look down and say you're playing like a nigger. There are very few things that I regret doing in my life, that's one of them. He did not call me a nigger, I, I've never said that, but uh, the word did come up in the conversation and uh, it had a very negative effect on me. I think, you know, if you're a white person and say the word nigger, there's no, re there's no reason other than to hurt somebody or to cast a, a negative person out there. And if you're a Blue Alcindor at the time, that's how you have to take it. Some expected Alcindor to follow his coach to the college level. But after graduation, Donahue was at Holy Cross and Lou was 3,000 miles away at UCLA. Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes is presented by Oldsmobile and your local Oldsmobile dealers. Also brought to you by Nike, by Budweiser. Now is the perfect time to enjoy a brewery fresh, beechwood aged Budweiser. And by Wheaties, the breakfast of champions. Beyond its socially free environs, UCLA was Lou's choice because he had a comfort level with John Wooden. Coach Wooden had been raised in, in Southern Indiana and he saw the uh, the Ku Klux Klan at its worst. Well, he was familiar with black athletes and understood uh, what black aspirations were about. Ineligible to play on the varsity in his first year, Lou made his presence felt when he led the freshman team to a shocking 15-point victory over the Bruin varsity, the two-time defending national champions. His 31 points, 21 rebounds, and seven block shots put everyone on notice. It was one of the few times, and maybe the only time that I can think of, when I saw Wooden speechless. Scoring 56 points in his varsity debut, Alcindor led the Bruins to a 30-0 season and a national title. In an effort to even the playing field, the NCAA outlawed the dunk. When they changed the dunk rule, uh, we were very dismayed. We were very angry because Lou Alcindor was an awesome offensive threat to college basketball. The effect was it made Kareem a better basketball player. He, at that point, perfected the skyhook. Losing only twice at UCLA, Alcindor remains the only player ever to win three NCAA titles while capturing three Final Four MVP awards. Off the court, he was undergoing a spiritual transformation. I remember Lou in high school as a soft-spoken, thoughtful, accessible, very intelligent, sweet kid who, God help him, you know, was thinking about becoming a sports writer. I remember going into the locker room, reintroducing myself, and the sweetness was all gone. He seemed very hard. Wooden did do something um, in, in those years that, it, to protect his players, he really restricted them from a lot of interviews, and so most of us didn't get very close to Lou then. I get a letter from him. He goes on and on and on calling me a racist, and it was because I had written one line, and the line was, he says his family comes from what is now Nigeria. Well, he somehow twisted that to say that I was doubting him. And I think that revealed a great deal about Lou Alcindor at that time. This was a man who reflected his times. How could there not be anger and resentment? Uh, is Professor Edwards right? You did vote to boycott the Olympics? Everybody voted to boycott the Olympics. Does that not mean then that you will, uh, if asked to participate on the Olympic team, choose not to do so? I have no idea right now. The summer of 68 was a watershed for Alcindor. He boycotted the Olympic Games as a racial protest, converted from Roman Catholicism to Islam, and privately changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It was a significant character change. Lou is somebody else. I'm not Lou. I'm not that Catholic guy you knew. I'm a Muslim. I am Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Still publicly known as Lou Alcindor, Kareem spurned the ABA and was selected as the first overall pick in the 1969 NBA draft. But the relatively staid, old-line atmosphere of Milwaukee, Wisconsin was a foreign world. He was very depressed in a lot of ways because, you know, you're in Wisconsin now, you're now on the West Coast and you're not in New York. And on top of that was the fact he would get these migraines, and that would be the part that we would all shudder. In those days, an introverted Kareem just 
was not able to socially handle what was going on. Kareem uh, lived a very isolated life style in Milwaukee. Uh, Kareem's very much into jazz, that didn't exist there. There were too many cultural differences. There was nobody he could really relate to, and he was very young. There was nothing blatantly racial. But it always seemed like there was kind of a undertone of it. Kareem's loneliness did not translate onto the basketball court. In 1970, his 29 points and 15 rebounds a game earned him Rookie of the Year. The next season, he won MVP while teaming with Oscar Robertson for his first NBA title. Lou, congratulations. Oscar just paid you a great compliment. You had a great series. Congratulations. Ooh, big help. <laughs> Buoyed by his success on the court, Kareem married, went to Mecca, and publicly adopted his Islamic name. The white press thought that that was threatening. There was a slight to his family. Uh, there were, we were so uneducated about uh, black issues back then. It was not a political statement. It was about my religious beliefs and me trying to make an affirmation of what I believe in. Two years later, with Kareem's life seemingly in order, the ground upon which he stood suddenly shifted. A house he had purchased for his mentor, Hamas Abdul Khalis, was the scene of a bloodbath as six members of Hamas's family were slaughtered by the black Muslims. Every time he stepped on the floor, uh, he felt that his life was in danger. He realized he was out of control and over his head in dealing with people who were devotees of something that was violent, it could be vicious, could be racist. He just went in there trying to assert pride in his blackness and found himself caught up in things that were pretty awful. Despite winning two more MVPs and reaching the 1974 NBA Finals, life in Milwaukee remained difficult for Kareem. He wanted to go home. I preferred to go back to New York. I, I wanted to try and get back to, uh, to my roots and, and play for the Knicks. We were going to lose him as a free agent, so we had to do something. As a result, we had the best deal with the Lakers, so we ended up dealing him to L.A. The newest Laker. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Hope I can live up to the build-up. I, I think I can. I'd like to try. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. With Kareem in the paint, the Lakers improved steadily over the next two seasons. Meanwhile, Jabbar remained at odds with himself and the public, finally blowing his cool in the opener of the 1977-78 season. I don't know what happened. All I remember was turning around and there's somebody stretched out on the floor and there's Kareem bobbing up and down and I you know, it's like, what happened? Milwaukee's Kent Benson, who was playing in his first NBA game, was initiated with a sucker punch. For Kareem, a broken hand sidelined him for 20 games. At that time in his career, he had just about quit. I don't care what anyone said. On greatness level, he was a dog. With his career and marriage in recession, Kareem desperately needed a rebirth. Los Angeles Lakers select Irvin Magic Johnson, Michigan State. From their very first game together, Magic and Kareem generated a new excitement. Two seconds left, the Lakers down by one. The ball is the lead. Right left. Skyhook. I'm running over. I'm jumping. I'm choking. Crazy shot. I only one. You know, I'm going crazy. So we get into the, the locker room. And you know Kareem. Kareem shows no emotion. So he comes over to me and says, Young fellow, don't ever do that again. I'd lost a lot of enthusiasm. His skill and expertise at his position was what the team was lacking. It made it easy for me to smile. Infused with new life, the Lakers won the NBA title in Johnson's rookie season. The Magic Kareem connection produced eight NBA Finals appearance in the 80s. Kareem's finest hour, the 1985 championship, when he was named Finals MVP at 38 years old. Yet, for all their shared success, Kareem never quite fit into Magic Showtime. The hook shot was an odd adjunct to Showtime. As the years went on, Pat Riley was going to have to make a transition from it being so-called, uh, quote-unquote, Kareem's team to quote-unquote Magic's team. Two complicated guys. Two very strong egos. Man, he probably writes books on, on the whole psychology between the two of them and resentments and fears and also ways that they got along and, and admired each other. Magic was really the guy that told people what to do, but except for Kareem. Kareem, he, he would kind of... He didn't want to get too close. He didn't want to tell Kareem what to do because Kareem had a fighting personality. I know for a fact that there were two or three occasions where Magic and Kareem would, you know, go out to dinner and talk about whatever personal issues they may have been, but there was always harmony. 
I always thought that uh, at first Kareem resented Magic a little bit, and then as he grew up and went through some titles and went through the good times, Magic kind of amused him. Meanwhile, off the court, Kareem found some measure of happiness with his girlfriend, Cheryl Pistono. She gave birth to his second son. Cheryl was an outgoing woman who uh, uh, had no problem telling Kareem what she thought and telling Kareem that she thought he was wrong and he was missing this and you should do that and this is the woman who just got in his face and he decided to pay attention to her. He became more expressive, he became more outgoing, he was less uh, standoffish, he would allow people to approach him. I think you're the greatest, but my dad says you don't work hard enough on defense. And he says that lots of times you don't even run down court. And that you don't really try, except during the playoffs. The hell I don't. Listen, kid. I've been hearing that crap ever since I was at UCLA. I'm out there busting my buns every night. Tell your old man to drag Walton and near up and down the court for 48 minutes. At the height of his career in 1983, Kareem's Bel Air home was destroyed by fire. Everything was lost, including his priceless rugs and extensive jazz collection. But out of the ashes came a revelation for Kareem. The outpouring of people with gifts and their support and the love uh, really opened him up. He came the closest I have ever seen him to getting teary when he talked about all the people all over the country who sent him jazz records to replace the records that he had lost in the fire. And I think that for the first time, he began to realize that maybe he wasn't living in such a hostile world. When we return, Kareem faces life after basketball. Despite six NBA titles and a record six MVP awards, he can't land a coaching job in the NBA. Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes is presented by Oldsmobile and your local Oldsmobile dealers. Also brought to you by Lincoln Financial Group. Lincoln Financial Group, clear solutions in a complex world. By 1-800-COLLECT, the easy way to save. And by Burger King, where you can have the delicious king of fries. Burger King, when you have it your way, it just tastes better. Kareem told me that playing basketball was never fun. I was astonished. I couldn't believe it. I said, are, are you sure this is, it's just not fun? It's never fun? He said, no, it's not, it's, it's not fun. Yet, Kareem kept playing until 1989, when he decided his 20th campaign would be his last. In recognition of his greatness, the league gave the 41-year-old Jabbar a city-to-city -city farewell. Future Hall of Famer, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Everybody kind of smirked the whole time. That was a year-long smirk because it was all concocted and everything, and Kareem just wasn't that well-liked in his own city. It was a burden, but it was really great. It was something that I felt that I certainly owed the fans. If they, if they wanted to acknowledge me, I, I certainly had to acknowledge them. His teammates acknowledged him as well, giving him a $175,000 Rolls Royce. But to their surprise, he returned the gift 19 months later. Sometimes uh, people buy things that don't fit into your lifestyle. And, uh, you know, it would be a shame to leave something that expensive just sitting around. So I, I suppose he sold it. In retirement, Kareem's private life has run a bumpy road. In 1997, he sued a Miami Dolphins running back for changing his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and underwent anger management after assaulting a motorist. A year later, he was arrested in Toronto for possession of marijuana. Against this backdrop of social disharmony, Jabbar has lobbied the NBA for a coaching job. There are no takers. To have those kinds of incidents take place where, you know, there's some uh, example of road rage, I guess, and, 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 a, and a drug incident, teams really don't need that. And it shows the signs of immaturity, I guess, on Kareem's part, or unpredictability. There was a period of time where Kareem only wanted to play five years in the NBA. 
now for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to want to be a coach is from one to ten. That's as far on the spectrum as you can go. I don't think I've done anything that, that would demonstrate that I couldn't do this job, but uh, a lot of people take a very dim view of it. People don't think that I can be a leader in that sense, or they refuse to think that I could uh, sustain the commitment. Coaching is all about people skills and relationships, but I'm not sure that he really has the background or the training or the ability to be that kind of a person. Front page tragedies, broken relationships, brushes with the law, wars with the press, religious conversion. Because Kareem has lived such a full life, he's remembered more for those experiences than the 38,387 points he scored in his NBA career. He's viewed as an unsympathetic figure in the world of basketball. When he needs something, he, he will open up. He will make himself available. He will give us the charm and the wit and the simple availability that ordinarily uh, he won't. I think most of his life he's enjoyed being different and being perceived as different, not letting people be at ease around him. I think he gets off on that. The press gets thoroughly pissed off at him, creates this persona of the aloof, unpleasant, surly Kareem. When in fact, He's, he's, he's funny, he's smart, he's nice. He just doesn't like these guys. He may get up and see you and be standing right by, beside you in the morning, but he, he just wouldn't say good morning. But that didn't make him a bad person. He was just into his world. I think that he's an intense, self-absorbed intellectual. I think that he's a seeker. To his life yet without it he has wandered an intellectual a loner a coach without portfolio after lobbying unsuccessfully for an nba coaching job kareem accepted an unpaid position as a high school assistant coach on the white mountain apache reservation in arizona the search for identity goes on we will see you next week when the 50 greatest athletes of the 20th century continues its countdown with number 25. this has been a presentation of espn the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com, a part of the Go Network. Go.com.